Unfortunately, I'm still figuring out a few things about my new Sony uh, Handycam and I thought I had taken still images of this uh, area where I put in the number 8 turnout but uh, I hadn't or, or I had and I couldn't find them so I have had to go back and reconstruct that and in a way it kind of worked out to an advantage because I'm actually going to be talking about roadbed as part of it too, so it really fits in this episode as well. So we'll get we'll kind of retrace a little bit about how I did that and then talk about the roadbed on top of it because it really all kind of fits together. So with the start of this episode, um, I got to the point where I had sanded all of the tops about 65 feet or more of the uh, sandwiched eight ply uh, masonite hardboard uh, sub roadbed. It's kind of a messy job, uh, but uh, I figured out a way to make it uh, less messy. I wouldn't say not messy, but le a lot less messy. And I did it by fitting a, one of the uh, uh, nozzles to my uh, uh, Ryabi battery-powered uh, handy back, uh, shoulder back, to the back of the uh, rotary, uh, the uh, belt sander, my Craftsman 4-inch uh, electric belt sander, handheld belt sander. And uh, that, that did a pretty good job. That was picking up the dust as it was flying out the back of the sander. And the sander has a catch bag, but it really doesn't do all that great. But between two of them, I probably caught about 80% of the dust coming off of it. So it made the job a lot neater. And then I uh, took one of my robot vacuum cleaners, uh, EcoVac, and sent it around the floor in a Swiffer dust mop. And I pretty much got all the dust. So it, it works pretty well. So kind of if you're... If you're looking to do that, it's a couple of handy suggestions. Uh, you can you probably got a shop vac or something similar that you can fit the nozzle to the back of the uh, uh, sander and pick up dust that way. And just be prepared to do some cleaning up. But it won't be the last time you'll do that with building a layout like this. So with that, what I had done at that point is I had made the uh, top of the sub road bed fairly level uh, and uh, resign yourself to the fact that you're never going to make a level road bed merely by lining up the splines. Uh, 
things just don't work that well that way. I mean, you get close to it, but you're always going to have to go back in and sand and level. So it's an inevitable thing you have to do. But once I went back in and sanded it, I got a good smooth surface on which to glue down a cork road bed. And you can see right now, at this point, what I've got is the cork road bed is in on both the main line and the branch line all the way from the east end of the staging yard to the entry to the smaller town over in this area over here. And that's all done and that actually goes pretty quickly. I'll show you how you do it uh, and uh, talk about that in a minute. And then uh, I've also started to run the main power bus feeds for this and that's really important. This is a good time to do this. You've got your cork road bed in and now you know where the track is going to be and you run a one, want to run your power feeds such that you can get to them once the scenery is in and they're, they're very convenient to wire them in. Now one of the things we'll do once the track is down and there's a number of stages to this is wire in the drops from the power bus to each rail and of course the, the uh, six foot rule based on nickel silver rail resistance so we'll be doing that also. But that's where we are right now. I've got half of the power bus in. I've got all the cork road bed down. The next thing I'll have to do is complete the power bus. But I wanted to talk about putting down cork road bed first of all, and then we'll get to that, that missing segment about the turnout. Now, one of the things that I do with uh, cork road bed is uh, now you're going to start using a little bit different adhesives. And uh, what I use here in this graphic, you can see I've got my, my cork road bed half down there, and I've got uh, uh, a tube and a caulking gun of uh, good old DAP uh, ad adhesive latex caulk. Uh, it's not a real strong adhesive like the PL510. Once something is glued with PL510 or liquid nails, it's there. You're not going to pull it off. But it's more than strong enough to hold down cork road bed, and we're also going to be using it later to hold the track down. Uh, ultimately, the track is never really held down by spikes or nails uh, because they can present other problems. I'll use them temporarily to secure the track while the, the caulk dries, but they make a very good bond and also they're not such a strong bond that you can't pull the track up later and do modifications or corrections if you need to. So uh, DAP and season caulk works, works real well and uh, don't use the silicone caulk, just use the plain old acrylic latex adhesive caulk. And uh, in the caulking gun, you basically, as it shows in the graphics, you spread a bead and lay down one side of the cork road bed. As I said, the cork road bed comes in what looks like rectangular strips, but they're actually cut on a bevel down the middle to model, to model the edge of the, the ballast of the railroad. So you split that and you glue down, and it's advisable to go all the way around the section you're laying down by gluing down one side, as you see here. And you can see that in this next graphic that uh, what I've done is I've used uh, push pins to hold the, the ends of the uh, cork road bed in alignment. And this is a necessary thing to do. Uh, it will want to kind of try to slip out of that, although it's pretty flexible. And right out of the tube, the latex caulk has enough grab to hold it pretty much where you want it. So you really only need to use the push pins on each end to make sure they stay aligned as you go from section to section. Once that's all down, uh, you can go back and, and the, the caulk heats, uh, sets up pretty much in about a half hour. So you've got a good bond. Uh, and you can go back in and then pull the pins out and then go back in and lay your other course, the other side of the cork road bed. And do that just as it shows in the graphics there. Run another bead of caulk and then take your, your strip of cork road bed and always overlap your joints. Don't, don't make the joints at the same place. It's always good to overlap them. Go in and overlap them and use the push pins to hold them down. And then I just let the whole thing sit overnight. I mean, this putting down all this cork road bed, about 70-ish feet of it, uh, it was probably about an hour and a half worth of work, so not, not all that much. And uh, let it cure overnight, and then come down the next morning, and then you have to do your final leveling. You're always leveling on this, because stuff is going to be, it's a progressive fact to get things, uh, process to get things leveled. And there's going to be things that are going to happen that are, that are going to force things out of level. For instance, the cork road bed, you're seldom going to get a level seam across the two sides. So you just need to smooth that out anyway. And the other thing is you need to make sure that you've got a, on your curves, if you're doing any super elevation, you want it super elevated towards the inside of the curve, not the outside of the curve. Super elevation, just a fancy term for an embanked curve. Not a great deal, not a great deal. But you want to make sure that that bubble is just a little bit to the inside of the curve. When I say bubble, I'm talking about bubble on a, on a handy uh, two inch or four inch pocket level that's uh, sufficient to it. 
Now, the way you can, and, and leveling the cork road bed is a very simple process, and there's a couple of really good tools for that. And that's, there's something called sure forms, uh, made by Stanley. This is a little 2 inch sure form with a curved blade. This is a 10 inch with a straight level blade. Uh, this thing works really well on cork road bed. Uh, you can take off cork road bed in nice smooth shaves and you get yourself a nice level surface. You can surface on here, you can't feel that seam in the middle so the track will lay down nicely to it. And you can tailor your super elevation on the curves just a little bit. You don't want to take too much off. And just use your bubble level, your little 2 inch bubble or 4 inch bubble level to make sure that you've got the right kind of super elevation on here. And I did that all the way around. And after I did that, I went in and started putting in the power buses. I said I've still got two, two more power buses over here to do, but I've got it down on that area. And once the power buses are in, then I'll go to the next step. Now, to detour back about what I was saying about the uh, switch block that I didn't get to in the last one. This is the switch block for the number 8 turnout that's going in here. Uh, I showed you the number 8 turnout the last time, and uh, you see how it fits in here. And this, for this, I'm actually using a, uh, a neoprene material with adhesive backing that is the exact same thickness as cork road bed. Again, I found it on good old Amazon. I got two sheets of it for about 12 bucks, and the sheets are 12 inches by 36 inches or something like that. So I've got plenty of material. This is what I'm going to be using for all of my road bed for my turnout. So the reason I'm using this is that I can cut out the entire shape of the turnout out of one continuous piece of road bed. If you don't do that, then you have to fit a shape of the turnout out of these strips of cork road bed. To be quite honest, that's pretty much a pain in the neck. Okay, I mean you can do it, people are fairly adept at it, but I can make one of these switch blocks out of the neoprene, which has the same compressibility as the cork, uh, in about a third of the time it takes to fit together piece by piece a switch block or turnout block out of cork road bed. So you might want to think about that. Self-adhesive on the back. Now, unfortunately though, that I'd already put this down before I discovered that the still pictures I took for the last episode didn't come out. So I had to kind of work around this to show you the process of how I made this. And the first thing I did is, I, on this graphic, it shows the number 8 turnout sitting on top of the template. Okay, And I made a template out of cardstock to show the, the level area I want to describe for the number 8 turnout. Essentially, I laid the number 8 turnout on a large piece of cardstock and then marked the ends of the turnout, the ends of the ties as it went on both sides of the turnout the location of the throw bar, and I made the next picture the number 8 turnout template that you see there, and laid that on the road bed before I put any, the sub road bed, before I put any road bed on it. And in fact, it was only the sub road bed for the main line, okay, because I wanted to find where I was going to define the ends of the turnout and where I needed to mount the switch machine and where the point of divergence was going to occur. Then I went into my shop and I made a wood block. You see the next picture shot from underneath of the wood block that is a number eight divergence. And that actually, in terms of degrees, it's uh, uh, 7.9, or excuse me, 7.15 degrees, or 7 degrees 9 minutes. Uh, easy enough to do on a compound miter box. I've got a compound miter box electric saw and I just set it up for 7 degrees 9 minutes and cut this divergent piece. And then I positioned it so that the point, the convergence of the diverging pieces coincided with the alignment of the straight portions of the turnout. And I put that in the sub road bed on the, the straight side of the turnout and used that as a piece to lay up against the diverging pieces of the laminated masonite road bed. And you can see that in the underside view that I've got the outer two courses laying up on the side of the divergence and then just built the rest of the sub road bed for both sides, the inside portions from that point forward. And that's how I got the piece for my number 8 turnout. And when I lay the track here, what I'm going to have to do is drill a hole through and set up the mounting plate for the tortoise slow motion switch machine, which is going to go right under here. And I'm using tortoise slow motion switch machines for the mainline turnouts because they're, they're very reliable, they're very powerful, and they also emulate exactly how real automatic remotely controlled switch machines work on real railroads. They don't really snap the turnout. You can see they're electro-pneumatic and you can see them move the points over. So they look very realistic. They act very realistic. And with that, 
that explains how I'm going to put this in. Now, talking a little bit more about track and roadbed. Uh, up to this point, most of the subject of the presentations have been the engineering, mechanical, technical side of building the model railroad. And now, when it comes to track, uh, we're going to start transitioning into some of the artistic aspects because uh, track is really a scenic element on a model railroad and there's an artistry associated with it and there's a lot of art associated with it but there's also a lot of engineering associated with it because you want track to be two things. You want it first of all to be reliable. Nothing can spoil the fun of a model railroad more than track that is not reliable where you're having derailments and and uh, all kinds of issues. It's not clean enough so you want you want to make sure you get the mechanical reliability first but you also want the track to be realistic. Uh, for that reason you're going to do things like painting the side of the rails because they're not shining on a real railroad. Only the upper surface is shiny. The side of the rails are a combination of grease and rust color and they're, and they're actually made out of a steel, a type of steel that actually performs, produces its own protective coating by its own rust so it won't rust any further. Uh, and uh, so you want to replicate that and look because people are going to look at the railroad, they're going to see the trains but they're going to see the track and uh, the trains come and go but the track is a permanent scenic feature and it's the one that gets a lot of attention so good looking track is very very key to enhancing the realism and enjoyment of your model railroad so we're going to be doing things that are both combination of engineering and artistry and one of the first things we're going to do is in a profile and I'll show a profile cross section here on graphic uh, in real railroad there's, there's railroads there is the immediate roadbed under the track which is a ballasted roadbed but then there's also a sub roadbed so there's actually two bevels and you'll see from the graphic how this how this works in cross section and how I'm going to create this on the model railroad is by using a product called XPS extruded polystyrene this is a piece of it and I'm going to glue it because the roadbed is overhanging the sub roadbed this much. I'm going to glue these pieces. It's rigid polystyrene, but it will bend. I'm going to glue these in like this, okay? And then I'm going to bevel the edge to produce the effect, the scenic effect of a real sub roadbed. Now, this gets to a larger point. One of the techniques I'm going to use for scenery on the layout that I really like is uh, using expanded polystyrene. And there was a very good article in the most recent issue of Model Railroader about a new techie technique in using expanded polystyrene. And I'm really uh, looking forward to employing that because it, it looks like it'll be a lot of fun and it'll enable, to, enable me to get some very realistic scenery at a very minor cost. And uh, I'll go more into that when we're actually building scenery uh, because it just gets too involved to explain here without actually showing you. But this is the material. I want to talk just a little bit about this, the material you use. Now there are two kinds of styrene foam. And if you're interested in using styrene for scenery, you need to be careful which one you use. This is the one you must not use. This is what's called uh, expanded polystyrene, EPS. Okay, This is the stuff we use in all kinds of packaging for electronics and stereo equipment and who knows what else. All the stuff you get in the mail and packages it always comes with this stuff around it. Uh, this is expanded polystyrene. Don't use this. Okay, This, when you notice it's all kinds of beads. It's puffed up beads. Uh, it is terrible material used for scenery. So get this, keep it for your stereo, don't try to use it on the model railroad. Bye bye po expanded polystyrene. This is extruded polystyrene. Okay, this is a polystyrene that is not made by expanding polystyrene uh, pellets, but it's actually extruded through forms. It has a completely different cellular structure. Okay, and you can always tell you're dealing with it. This happens to be from Lowe's, their particular product, because it's called XPS. This is called EPS. When you go shopping for polystyrene foam for scenery, always get XPS. That's extruded polystyrene. Now it comes in a variety of colors. Some, I think, uh, Dow's is blue. Uh, Lowe's, theirs is this light green color. Uh, Corning makes it uh, called the Fomular. It's a pink color, uh, but they're all XPS, and those are what you want to be using for your scenery. And it's great stuff to work with. It's very light, uh, very inexpensive. You can make a lot of scenery with it, with a, with a few sheets and uh, it's very easy to use. And the next couple graphics show you how I, uh, 
how I made these strips. Basically, I got two four by eight foot sheets of three quarter inch XPS, brought it home and laid it down on my little work tables it shows there with my carpenter square. And oh, to get it in my Prius, I couldn't put four by eight sheets in there, so right in the parking lot of the Lowe's, I just cut it into three equal sized chunks for each one and threw it in the back of the Prius. It didn't need to be neat, it was, you know, square enough. So I came home and I put them on my little makeshift work table and used my 48 inch carpenter's T-square to line up nice square strips and all you have to do is use your handy razor knife, your, your box cutter knife and line it up against the, the blade of your T-square and score down lightly and then do a second pass which will basically take you down probably 75 or out of the way through the, the polystyrene, maybe more. And then you just do what we call bend and snap. You just take the piece right here, it's on the edge of the, on the, edge of the polystyrene, and you just bend it down, you hear it crinkle and pop up and it snaps right off and you have yourself a three quarter inch by three quarter inch piece. And what I will do, and I will start in that, my next project after I finish running the power bus, is essentially, and all you need to use is a hot glue gun. Plain old little dime store hot glue gun, like, like this one right here. You know, five, six bucks, okay. Uh, a hot glue gun, and they're glue gun sticks, and it works fast because the glue sets up. Put a little right here, slap it up against there, and then work the glue gun between the joint, and just push it up against it. And inside of 15 seconds, the glue will set up, and you can take your hand off, and it's, it's stuck there. And that will that will provide a surface where we can come in and bevel the other the outer side of the subroad bed and also it provides a place to attach the scenery screening so you can bring the scenery up to the road bed so it'll look like a railroad built through a mountains rather than mountains built up to a railroad uh, so or whatever scenery you're doing so with that I'm gonna get busy with this and then uh, in a day or so I'm gonna resume maybe hopefully show you how I've got all the power bus in and how this is all set up and then we're gonna start laying track Okay, yesterday I talked about what we were going to do with the building out the road bed from the sides using the XPS foam. And I was down here for about 45 minutes earlier today and I put in all the foam on the branch line adjacent to the track. You can see it's all, all on there now and I'm going to, in a moment, going to start putting it on the main line. So I put in, in about an hour, uh, about 35 feet of the foam. About half of the foam I'll have to put in it went very quickly. And uh, towards the end of this segment, I'll show you how I did it using a hot glue gun. The hot glue gun is warming up right now. But what I want to do, first of all, is kind of recap a little bit and show how this is all going together. And these next couple graphics explain this. The first graphic shows uh, the cutaway profile of real railroad track. Uh, the, the rails fastened to cross ties with tie plates and fasteners. Uh, in uh, these pneumatically driven spikes, but there are also rail clamps that go from the tie plates. This sits on top of crushed stone ballast, and the crushed stone varies. Different railroads have different preferences of what they like to use. Uh, the Chicago Northwestern was known for using a pink granite ballast, uh, ballast kind of distinctive. Uh, Union Pacific basically uses a gray granite stone, fairly, fairly common. And uh, this stone used for ballast is usually uh, in a size from two to about five inches, so it's it's a pretty good sized stone, but it has a locking action. And the purpose of the ballast is to provide a nice, smooth, stabilizing surface that's well drained. Water can drain down through it, so it doesn't sit around the cross ties, the wooden cross ties, or concrete cross ties, which are more in favor today, and uh, cause problems, subgrade problems. So they're the the it's a uh, cushioning surface for the track, and it's also around the ties. It's a stabilizing surface. It keeps the track in place because of the locking action of the stone. So it's uh, very important, and uh, railroads, uh, major railroads, spend a lot of effort making sure their track and ballast is in good condition because it, it bears an extremely heavy load when trains go through. So it's really important, and uh, they they maintain this very very closely and use a lot of modern technologies to do it. And then that sits on top of a crushed stone and soil, stabilized soil uh, subroad bed, which is to provide an impervious layer so water hits that, runs off the sides, doesn't sink down into the, the major supporting structure of the road, the uh, main line of the, of the railroad track, and so it can drain off to the sides. And that's what you see in that second layer in there. And then there's the graded terrain, which is actually the in-situ material, which has been graded and usually stabilized with a soil cement to provide a, a smooth surface on which to build the track structure. 
Now the second graphic shows how we are uh, making this in HO scale or model railroad uh, to emulate the structure. Of course it's not the same type material but on here I use the same graphic of real railroad track to uh, uh, show the, how this all fits together and so it'll look like it. So you can see there you see the flex track which I'll show you a piece of it here in a moment. But the flex track is sitting on the cork road bed which I've installed Okay, and that cork road bed is, is uh, sitting on top of the eight plies of 3 16th inch uh, masonite splines cut three quarters of an inch uh, in, in height or width and uh, cemented together as I showed you in prior episodes and that forms the, the spline road bed which is there to produce all the curvature and the major weight bearing part of the structure, the, the, the solid weight bearing for the, for the track. And then you can see the XPS foam, the three-quarter inch XPS green foam, this green foam that I, that I showed you yesterday that I cut in strips. That is, uh, so far I've glued to the outer surfaces both sides of the branch line. And again, I'll show how I do that in just a minute. I have to reposition the camera. But uh, that's on there. And you can see that with this graphic, there's the cleat that's supporting the, uh, the splines on, on the very bottom there. And then what I will do is when this is all set up, when all these pieces are together, I will start putting in the ballast after I put in the, some of the ballast will go up before I put the track down, but I'll talk about how that works a little later. It's a little hard to explain without showing you. Uh, so the ballast will go in there, HO scale ballast that emulates the, the real ballast, same color. I get it from uh, Woodland Scenics. Uh, it's, uh, they have all different colors of ballast and this, is, this emulates Union Pacific style ballast. And uh, then the scenery will be built up uh, on the XPS foam and applied to that. So with that, I'm going to, uh, oh, one other detail I wanted to talk about. This is the track that I'll be using on the uh, out, outer portion of the layout, or on the layout that is visible, not the staging yard. Uh, this is a finer grade of track. It's called Code 83. It uh, represents very closely uh, heavy-duty mainline track for American railroads. Uh, it's much more finely detailed than the Code 100 I'm using in the staging yard, but in there I'm just basically concerned about mechanical reliability. The cross ties are the appropriate dimension for uh, scale track. Uh, they're very fine. You can see the details finer. And they also in here, and I'm come up very close to the camera, and I don't know if you can see it, but in here you can see all the little spikes and tie plates are all modeled exactly to scale. So when this is all installed on the layout, it'll look a, a great deal like real track. Uh, the one thing I'll have to do, as I mentioned yesterday, is I'm going to have to paint the edge of the track to give the rusty, greasy color that's on there because you can see the real railroad track is not shiny like that on the side, just on the upper surface where the wheels keep polished. So with that, I'm going to reposition the camera and show you how I glue up the uh, uh, XPS foam to the side of the sub road bed. Okay, we're ready to start gluing the XPS foam to the side of the sub road bed. Now I've had my hot glue gun here set on the high heat setting, warming up for about five minutes so it's all ready to go and you can see that uh, when you pull the trigger here a, a bead of glue comes out the end. The glue is on these sticks, comes in these, these sticks and they feed in the back. I'm sure a lot of people have used a hot glue gun before. It's uh, basically a, a wax type adhesive. Uh, the one thing you have to realize about it is, is it, uh, as soon as it hits the, the masonite on the side here, it's going to start cooling and setting. It'll set up very, very quickly. So uh, you have to work a little bit quickly, but there's a little trick here I'll show you in a moment. One thing to be careful about with the uh, hot glue gun is uh, this thing is hot. Okay, the, the body here is not hot, but the tip is hot. So you need to be careful where you set it. So I have something uh, metal, not uh, wood, not paper to sit on to protect here. And this is, this is an old uh, griddle pan that we don't use anymore. I found down in the basement. It works perfectly. It's got a lip to keep the gun from slipping off. And I can put a bunch of sticks here so I don't have to go looking for them. Because you, you do go through these sticks pretty quickly. So this is how I put the, the XPS strips on. We're going to put a strip in here and we'll get a strip and before I put it in I'll just see there's the, the outer surface. I'll just make sure that it fits in there without a problem. Okay, that's good. 
And I learned a little trick here with this. Uh, you want the glue to stay hot as possible uh, to put it up there, but you need to work fairly quickly. So what I've done, and I always have a, a spare stick here in my hand ready to go because you're going to go through these pretty quickly. And I will go along here and put a globs of glue along this strip. Just squeeze it out. You can see the globs forming there on the strip. And you got to get ready to put another strip, another stick of glue in there. And okay, go back and hit a few over here. And that's about all the longer you want to take. Take the strip, lay it up there, and press it in. And as soon as that hot glue hits that masonite, it's going to start setting up. It's going to cool down. This will set up in about 20 seconds. Uh, just hold a little bit of pressure in on it, and the, although this is rigid foam, this is not much of a bend. It'll easily bend to this shape, and take your hand off. The XPS is glued. Now, half the time you're going to be working on the other side of where you want to be able to see, because you've got the back side here to do. Well, what I'd usually do is do the same kind of technique, okay, get myself a strip, Make sure I've got a good fit back here. You don't have to worry about overlapping seams or anything. You just just make sure you got a good little fit in there. And again, take my glue gun. Got plenty of a stick in there. Run it along. Lots of globs. And if you get this uh, hot glue on you, it's it's about basically like getting candle wax on your hand. It's not all that bad. Uh, just wait a. a a few seconds and you can peel it off just like candle wax. Set the high glue gun over there. Press this into the shape. Hold it for a few seconds. And you're done. All set. And that's how you glue the XPS for your scenery along the roadbed. Okay, the XPS foam has all been installed and you can see now I'm working on the beginning of the ballasting and what I've done is I've taken blue scotch painters tape, fairly wide to strip it, taped it to the edge of the foam and I did that in part because we don't want the scenic materials, the excess, to spill off on the floor and get swept up. I'd like to be able to recycle it and use it so because it can get expensive. And I put that around on all of the foam that I put in. And now I'm beginning the preparation of the ballasting of the track. Now the ballast I'm using is typical of what Union Pacific uses. It's uh, this is by Woodland Scenics. This bag is a little little messy, but it's uh, medium gray, medium sized gray, uh, gray blend ballast, and it represents a, a granite limestone mixture. A ballast very common on a lot of railroads. Uh, it's very very light material. You can see here I'll with my hand, but this is this is very light material, and you can see it there. And the size emulates aggregate between two, three, and five inches, six inches. That's used for ballast on real railroads, and you can see it's right there. Now the problem is this stuff is very light, and you got to get it to stay down, and it won't assume a proper angle of repose. Angle of repose is what a, what a material will assume in terms of angle if it's left to, on a slope and uh, this stuff won't, won't emulate regular ballast uh, for an angle of repose. So what I have to do is have a way to glue it to the side of the roadbed. I'm only doing the side of the roadbed right now because when I come back I'll put the track in and do the final ballasting but this will keep the this will allow the ballast that I put on addition to have the same proper angle of repose and the way I've determined to do this that I've done before is uh, use paint as an adhesive and just on the side of the roadbed. Now I took some of the ballast and I took an index card and smeared wallpaper paste on it and glued ballast to it until I got a uniform coat and then I went to my local Home Depot and I got a quart of paint made up. Now what they can do is they could take this ballast and scan it and get a gray that emulates the, ba the ballast, which they did. 
and a cork will go a long way. And the cork allows me to put a, a layer of paint, a good goopy layer of paint, on the edge of the roadbed and then come back and sprinkle ballast on it. Now you'll notice some of the technique I'll show you. I'll move the camera so you can see more closely what I'm doing. But uh, this allows me to, to model a profile, an accurate profile of ballast on the edge of the track. And this is part of where I've talked about in the previous session where uh, laying track is both an artistic endeavor and a technical endeavor. And this is on the artistic side because I want it to look very convincing. And uh, so with that, I will reposition the camera and I'll show you a little more closely how I go about doing this. Now, you can see what I've got here is a little bit of a section. You can see I've just come up here with the ballast on each side. And this is roadbed. Here's the tape. Here's the green foam. And notice no ballast in here. So the way I do this is I take a small half inch brush, like this one, get a good load of paint on the end of it, and then bring it up here and just go along and just try to get the edge of the road bed. Now don't worry about it being exactly neat on that because you're going to come back you're going to correct this a little later. I'm just going to do a little section here to show you how to do it. And this is just running along here and what you want to do is you get a good goop of paint on there to act like an adhesive. Just put a little more and then Come in with a little kitchen scoop, like this, with ballast in it. You can see the ballast there, and then just lightly tap it to fall down on this. Don't worry about a big pile of container. We'll, we'll take care of that later. Okay, and this is just going to settle in there, and the ballast in closest contact with the paint is going to become permanently adhered to the edge of the roadbed and let's return this. And oh by the way, I use a, a coffee can here. I empty the bags of ballast. It's slightly easier to handle Maxwell House coffee can with a lid on it. Just label it ballast and uh, dump it so hold a couple bags. Give you plenty to work with and just keep the scoop in there. And you'll notice one other thing here. I did leave a gap. Uh, the reason is I'll come back later and I'll fill in these gaps with between the areas that I've done because you really don't want to get ballast in your paint. Okay, I want to have clean paint to put it on and then sprinkle ballast on it and then I'm going to come back and do these gaps. But before I do the gaps, I've got a small vacuum cleaner and I'll show you that in the next segment. And I'm going to come through and I'm going to vacuum up all the ballast that did not stick. It'll be quite a bit of it. And then return it to my coffee can to be used again. And so that saves money, saves ballast, and cleans everything up so that when I come in here to paint these gaps, there will only be the ballast that's stuck to the paint. It won't get all sucked up in the paint again. And also, we'll clean, I'll show you how we clean off the upper surface of the, the uh, uh, roadbed and the, the sides here. That'll all come later. But this is how we start the ballasting, the scenic work on the track. Well, a few days have passed, and... Uh... I haven't really done many videos here, and I've got a lot to report. I'm done. Not going to be a long segment here, but uh, been very busy. Uh, first of all, you recall I've uh, been using the gray paint and ballast to get the correct angle of repose on the ballast under the track, the profile of the track for the roadbed, and that is all done. And I've actually laid all the track between the east end of the staging yard and the town of Warrenville Junction, just short of that. And that's my name for the mountain town, if I haven't mentioned it before. And uh, interestingly, I, I totaled up the amount of track I've laid, and I was a little off on my estimate. I've actually uh, put down 84 feet of track. Uh, for those of you that may not, may not know it, in HO scale, that's about one and one-third miles of track. So that's a fair amount of track. And at this point, uh, I have uh, tested it. I've used my little uh, test car here, this most finicky piece of equipment I've got. If there's a defect, as I said before, it'll find it. And uh, roll it back and forth, and I'm happy to report everything is, is good. Uh, this diagram shows one thing that, that I'm going to put a diagram here now on the screen uh, that you have to be careful about with the uh, uh, rail joiners here. There's a couple rail joiners where, right where I'm rubbing my fingers. And that's called uh, a lapped joint. Uh, you don't want to make a lapped joint uh, because that, that means one, one rail has not engaged properly with the rail joiner and it creates a bump. 
and it's a source for future derailments and major headaches, particularly if it's in a tunnel or someplace you can't get to. So you want to be particularly careful about that. That's one of the things you do with the uh, test car here. It will, it will spot a lap joint, but there's just a very simple test too. Just when your track is down, just run your fingers along the rails, the tops of the rails, and you will feel a lapsed joint. You'll feel the snag. Okay, and that will tell you something you got to go back and fix. You now, hopefully, when you're actually laying the track is when you're attentive to that. But hey, even, it, I've I've occasionally found one on track I thought was good, and uh, you know, not very often. But you want to be careful about it because it can be a major major headache. Uh, another thing you'll notice here is at the point where the the flex track is joined, the sections are joined. There's a gap because you have to cut out some ties. To be able to do this because as you bend the flex track the inside rail is going to be longer than the outside rail so you have to use your rail nippers uh, to uh, uh, cut the rail and in fact let me take a step over here I'll be right back talks amongst yourselves on the subject of track laying. Uh, talking about rail nippers, here's uh, three tools you're going to be using a lot of when you when you lay track. Uh, these are specifically designed rail nippers. They're made by a company called Juron and they're designed to cut model railroad rail and they cut flush on this side. They're flush cutting jaws. Uh, you shouldn't use them for cutting anything else. Uh, hard steel wire will dull these so you don't want to use that but this is what you use to cut your rail to, to uh, length and these are also by Juron these are flush cutting you can use this to dress up the end of rail uh, you can see I've got some some caulk on there and uh, you can use it also to nip out ties and also a good you know good old trusty pair of needle nose pliers uh, these come in handy for example holding a, a, when you're putting the track together holding the grip on the fish plate, the tie, the rail joint, or railroad term for these is called a fish plate. Don't ask me where they came from. Fish plate is what we call it here in the states, and uh, and sliding it on there, so it helps uh, helps you guide guide it on there. And once uh, this is all set up, and again, I use the process of, of using uh, adhesive caulk, a DAP adhesive caulk. Run a thin bead, uh, flatten it out with a with a putty knife. You don't need a huge thick coat of it, and then just press the uh, uh, track down into it. And then what I use is, is there are holes drilled, I drill holes in the ties here. There's dimples on the other side of this track where you can drill guide holes, and I use push pins to hold it down while the caulk hardens up. Just about a half hour, but I let it harden up overnight just to be sure. And this this is not like super glue. It's not permanently glued down, but it's it's well and good enough for a bond for the track. And once this is all hardened up and before I start other uh, scenic work with the track, I will have to get the, some spare cross ties, which you always have them when you, when you trim track, and trim them off, smooth them off, and slide them under this joint so you have cross ties here, because right now this is not very realistic, this big gap without cross ties. And as far as that goes, as far as dressing up the track, um, I had a decision to make at this point, what I wanted to do, and uh, you can see the wiring bus is all is all run. You can see it here on the under the the track. Uh, I think what I'm going to do at this point is uh, wire in this portion of the digital command control system. It's all set up. It's all the terminals are all there, and I just have to do the connect, the feed wires to the track. And once I do that, I'm going to start working on building Warrenville Junction and track one around. So I'm not going to get to ballasting or painting the track at this point because I don't want to really get too far ahead of, ahead of my skis on this thing. And uh, plus I'd like to be able to run trains around the layout. So I'm going to be concentrated on building the main line clear around the layout. I'm not going to build the yards or towns. I'm just going to build the loop of the main line. And so I can get some trains running because I know everybody wants to see trains running. And uh, that's that's going to be my focus. So I don't want to I don't want to go back and do a lot more work on this track right now because I, I'll save that for when I can do it on on all the track and work my way through it. And also I've been uh, a side project playing around with uh, some scenic projects. I'll tell you about a little bit later. Uh, I've been uh, making rock molds and I'm conducting an experiment right now to uh, see how 
see how I can do plaster castings on in latex molds of rocks for some of my scenery and uh, we'll see how that goes and I'll talk more about that later. But that's where we are right now and uh, I'm uh, owe you an apology for not posting too many videos here recently but it's been focusing on a whole bunch of things going on and, and uh, also with, with getting the uh, the layout to this point and uh, hopefully we'll see this in a few days and uh, that's it for now.